Hey, what's up, Afrotech world? This is Jeff Nelson. I am the co-founder and chief technology officer of Blavity Inc. I'm here with a very special guest, uh, Jeff Staple. Got to say I like the name, uh, but I'm here and honored to have this conversation with you. With you, uh, Many people in our audience, I'm sure, are familiar with you. You are one of the OG visionaries uh, in so many, so many different industries, so streetwear, fashion, sneakers, design in general. Um, so it's cool to have this conversation with you and just learn about how, you know, your passion and how you develop your brands, but also how those brands are intersecting with technology as we look forward to the future and talking about Web3 and the metaverse and things like that. Um, so, so my first question is, you know, I want to take um, a trip down memory lane. So in, in 1997, you, you started Staple Design. Um, when I hear 1997, I don't know about you. I'm like, oh, 97, that wasn't that long ago. But when you do the math, that was 25 years ago, right? So you built this brand that has been relevant for literally decades and it's transcended so many different things, right? That, that I just mentioned, you know, fashion, design, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk about when it clicked for you incorporating technology into these brands and all that you do, you know, sort of what was the genesis of that idea and how, how did that come to fruition? Um, well, first of all, Jeff, thanks for having me on and shout out to Afrotech and everyone out there watching. Um, definitely honored to be uh, part of this talk and share some ideas. Um, and I, I guess we must be of similar generation, Jeff, because I'm the same. Like when I hear that song 93 till infinity, that doesn't feel that long ago to me, but 93 is like most of my employees weren't even alive yet. You know, I have to like remember that. Um, so it is it is crazy how time flies. Um, and it's definitely a blessing that uh, what I've been able to create has been able to transcend, you know, decades and generations. I see fathers and their kids both rocking staple and, you know, both rocking stuff that I've done. So it's really cool. Um, well, to answer your question about like technology and how that plays into fashion and art, this this occurred for me really, really early on, man. I mean, you know, I feel like half of this conversation is going to be about how, how I'm going to date myself. But I remember when we first started marketing, right? Like the idea of like going viral or marketing meant uh, you would make a postcard at like, they had these companies called like 1-800 postcards, which was honestly like a technological wonder because before that making flyers, posters or postcards was like a very gated process. Like you really needed to know offset printers and stuff like that. Then these companies came out with this concept called, called gang run printing, which I know sounds really like you know, mischievous, but it's not. Gang run printing are these companies that basically said, hey, there's all these people throwing parties and they need flyers and they need invites and all these DJs want to promote their night. Why don't, instead of working with them individually, why don't we call them all in, like 50 of them, and basically put all their flyers on one big printer and then print it all at once and slice them up and give it to each person, but everyone saves money, right? So it's like this sort of like really communal thing. And I remember when I would get postcards made and I would drop them off at like record shops and cafes and bars. The my, my social media marketing budget at the time was basically how many inches of postcards I would leave at each establishment. So if I, I thought this place was like popping, I'd be like, they get two inches. I'm gonna give them a yeah. two inch <laughs> stack, you know. But it's like if this place wasn't that popping, they get a quarter inch, you know what I mean? That was marketing back then. And even though it sounds really naive, but like. I was using technology at the time of what I had, because before that it was literally hand to mouth. Like you had to shake someone's hand and tell them about your brand. It was like word of mouth marketing. So this idea of using like postcards, something as dumb as that, you know, um, I, I, I learned really early that like, I have to go beyond myself and my ability to shake people's hands and kind of spread the knowledge as quickly as I possibly could. Um, obviously, print advertising was something that was happening back then, you know, in magazines and stuff. But the moment the, the digital revolution started to happen, where instead of putting an ad in a magazine and sort of crossing your fingers and being like, I hope hundreds of people see this, but I actually have no validation or idea if that's actually happening. You know, once once the analytics and the tracking of social media and, you know, just web one, really like websites started to come. I don't know if you remember um, uh, Google came out with like Blogspot and like yeah. Blogspot pages were like the first blog. Right. And you could pick your template and stuff like that. 
And I remember they added this feature where you can add a little ticker to the side of your website to show how many people had visited your website. And that was like, you know, this is pre likes, pre retweets or anything, but it's like every day I would wake up and be like, holy, like 12 people came over the, over the course of last night and visited, you know, and you would just wait to see that thing. But like that initial tracking of idea was so cool. Um, and I just think that I've always tried to stay um, somewhat, I, I want to say abreast of the technology. I don't want to call myself a technological innovator. Um, I, I do wait to see if when a technology comes out, if it has stickiness before I invest my time. You know, one thing that I want to emphasize is that time is the most valuable asset that any of us have. So for me to go in and be like, you know, I'm going to spend all of my money, time, energy, and effort on Vimeo, like that would have sucked. <laughs> like if I did that, you know, so like, no, no disrespect to Vimeo, but like, you got to pick and choose your battles to see like where you're going to go. Like, frankly, I'm not really on TikTok, nor is my brand. That might be a big mistake for my brand, you know, but we've chosen to be like, no, let's go, let's go with Instagram. Um, and now, as you mentioned, it alluded to web three. I mean, I'm, I'm all in on web three and I'm happy I am because I think if I had spent a lot of time and energy on TikTok, you know, maybe I might've looked at web three and been like, I don't have time for another thing. You know, I can't go into that. So that's sort of like my, my foray into technology. That, that's so cool. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, you, you tell the story about the postcards and how, you know, back then you were using tech even, you know, in, in the nineties when we don't think of those things as tech. Uh, but I think what it speaks to is just your ability to be, you know, relatively speaking ahead of the curve, even if just a step ahead. Right. Um, and that's, yeah. Super, super important. And so or it's, I, I call it scrappy. <laughs> it's scrappy, scrappy right? you know, yeah. the, the, the hustler mentality, right? Which, yeah. which is so important. And so you, you, you made this bet on Web3 and crypto. You're doing a lot of things in that space. I am curious for someone with your back, background in, in you know, being a creative, um, especially being a physical creator. Now mm -hmm. you're, you're, and I don't want to say transitioning because I don't think you're leaving that part of your, your ethos behind, but you're augmenting and, and complementing that with being a digital creator. So can you talk a little bit about that transition? What's different about creating in the digital space, but also what's similar uh, yeah. to, to your previous work? I mean, I got, I got to first preface this by saying my foray into Web3 is literally as of today, nine months old. Like mm -hmm. it is, it's brand spanking new. So it's completely fresh. It's complete. It's changing all the time. I'm learning every single day. People think I'm an expert. I'm not, nobody is an expert because it's constantly changing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I did dabble into uh, the web three NFT space last year um, by through the means of collaboration, you know? And, and if you look at the course of my career, uh, some people say that, I'm like the king of collaborations, but it's not because I was trying to own collaborations as a concept. What I was always trying to do was again, not go all in on something. So for example, when you know, I'm, a, I'm a big sneaker head, I really love sneakers. At any point in the past 25 years of Staples history, I could have said, I wanna start my own sneaker brand, right? Mm -hmm. I, I could have done that. But I was like, you know what? I've seen a lot of my friends try to start sneaker brands and it's challenging. And so why should I start a sneaker brand when I can call somebody at like Nike or New Balance or Timberland and be like, like, am I really going to make a boot better than Timberland? Like right. maybe in 20 years I will, you know? So like, how about I just work with Timberland and we sort of like complement each other on what we like to do. So when it, when it came time to the NFT crypto web three space, I said, instead of me just going full boat all in on crypto and NFT, let me learn from people who have been in it slightly longer um, and so my, my first collaboration was, was with a company called Zora, Z-O-R-A, which I suggest all of you check out. They're like the, the new marketplace. Secondly, then I collaborated with Artifact, R-T-F-K-T, which is a, you know, they're like the new digital Web3 brand, if you will. They actually just got acquired by Nike. Um, and then the third one was Gary Vaynerchuk and, and his V Friends program. So my first three steps into the space were with handheld with an expert or an expert at the time. And that allowed me to get a taste of it. And again, justify to myself whether this is going to be something that I really want to invest a lot of time, energy, and effort into. Obviously, I did. And then so we launched Stapleverse just a couple of months ago. Um, and it's been a game changer. So to answer your question, what do I love about uh, working in this space? There, there's two main things. Number one is 
that coming from someone who has made physical goods all their life, a lot of it overseas, you know, there are a ton of logistical hurdles that are in the creator's way in terms of getting something physically made, whether it's supply chain, minimum order quantities, middlemen, salesmen, shipping, tariffs, customs, all of this BS is essentially set up so that as many people as possible can make their slice of the pie, you know, and, and it's, it's the most unstreamlined thing ever. And the other thing is because of that, every time there's a hurdle, you are sacrificing a concept or an idea. You're like, oh, oh is it going to be eight weeks to make that thing that I wanted? All right, forget that thing. Let's just get it done. You know? And so that's a, that's a creative sacrifice that you're making, you know, in, in this world, in the digital world, Anything I dream, if it can be coded, it happens. Mm. It's like it's like me, my it's like my brain, a coder, consumer. That's it. There's like no nothing else, you know. And so that's really beautiful. Uh, and then the second thing that I really love about this is obviously ownership of your IP. You know, traditionally, if you think about being a fashion brand or a footwear brand, the success of your of your brand is a lot of times beholden on a retail store or like a sneaker store, you know, like if you have a sneaker brand, if you're not doing business with Foot Locker, you're probably not really doing business. You know what I mean? Uh, it's very, very difficult. Same with like department stores, or if you're an artist, if you're not going to be signed by a gallery or like a museum, it's very hard for you to break through, you know, and think about it now, if you sell your work to a gallerist, right, you, you get money for that transaction. Now that gallerist is going to sell it to another collector you now as a traditional artist or painter does not get any more money. And then when that guy now sells it to another collector, you, the, the chain of, of revenue stream stops for you, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the NFT world, because of the blockchain and smart contracts, I can put into my smart contract that I, the creator of this work, forever in perpetuity wants 10% of, 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 uh, of royalty on this. Oh, I can make up the percentage. And now every time that product or NFT or whatever is flipped, you just keep making perpetual royalties. Yeah. And that's a game changer. And it's not even, a, I mean, yes, it's a financial game changer, but it's a game changer because it's almost like, it's almost like buying a car and having fuel in your car every day. It's like, yeah. it's fuel for creativity. You know, I don't have to worry about the next thing because my, my babies are out there making money for me, you know? So that's the beautiful thing about um, this space. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because we've been talking a lot um, this year in our Afrotech series we've had, you know, we had Afrotech Miami in February where we talked a lot about NFTs and crypto and um, NFTs are, are, you know, this new concept and not, not everybody gets it. Some people still, and admittedly myself, before I really dug into the space, I was like, oh, these are just JPEGs, right? But what well, you just mentioned that smart contract, there's so much power in that where you can, if it can be coded, right? And you talk about creators and the ability to literally program in royalties, right? Where anytime a transaction happens, boom, 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 it's all backed by crypto, it's all backed by the blockchain, and it just happens, right? Mm -hmm. That gives you, that as an artist, that gives you so much leverage. So, so you know, thanks for uh, really demystifying that and putting it in layman's terms. So yeah, uh, people I'll, give you, I'll give you another yeah. analogy about yeah. people, because I have a lot of like friendly of debates. Yeah, okay. a lot of friendly debates with with friends who are like, "Yo, you're just selling JPEGs. It's it's worthless," you know. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, you remember the day when I got a blue check on Instagram? How salty you were! And they're like, <laughs> "Yeah." I was like, "You you actually told me that day you would pay money for a blue check." And I'm sure we all know people that would pay fifty dollars, five hundred dollars, probably five thousand dollars for a blue check. Yeah. So wait, you're gonna pay five thousand dollars for a a JPEG that's this right. big, what does that mean? It's it's not because of the artwork of the blue check. It's because of the it's because of the value that it holds when it sits on your telephone. That's right. that's the only place it sits. You know what I mean? So when when I tell people that, they're like, fine, I kind of understand. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like it's the connection that it has. You know, um, so we are already as humans trading on a on a on a digital only landscape. You know, like. Hey, if you if you go out and you buy an incredible piece of furniture like a Herman Miller chair or sofa, right? Great, congrats. You and six of your closest friends and family have seen that chair. Every other person that you're going to show that chair to, you're probably showing it to them on this device. 
yeah. that like 99% of the people that are going to see it, see it through this device. So you're already trading equity and value and clout on the mobile device digitally. And NFTs are just sort of like taking it all the way there where it's like, let's just forget the physical. Like, and that's, that's the scary part is because people are like, I don't want to forget the physical. It makes me feel good, you know? But if you think about it, as you said, it's less about an abandon, abandonment of the physical. It's just an added extension of it. Then I think it makes people feel more comfortable. That, that's a perfect analogy there. Um, and, and so there, there must be something about Jeff's, right? Because I can, can relate to this aspect of, of your story is this inability to be satisfied with just doing one thing, right? So, you know, you, you, we, we talked about, um, you know, since the 90s, how you've been, you've had your hands in so many different places, right? You're, you're certified sneakerhead, streetwear, fashion, design, you've got retail stores, all these different things. Now in the Web3 space, we talked about, you know, and alluded to the NFTs, but you've got the Stapleverse, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're here in Afrotech world in the Afrotech metaverse. Uh, you've got the Stapleverse. Tell me what is the Stapleverse, why it's cool, and why you decided to create that. The Stapleverse is my own personal Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm. <laughs> you know, so like, I don't know if, you, if there's any Marvel fans out there, but like, I'm a huge Marvel fan. And you know, one of the most impressive things is like the fact that, you know, this this saga has gone on for like 25 movies deep now, even more decades long, you know. But if you think about the genius of like, you know, the, the late one of the latest Marvel movies that came out is uh, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. Right. Those Ten Rings appeared in Iron Man one, like over a decade ago. So, you know, the producers just created this entire universe and they're just taking us along for the ride on this incredible journey. And so what I'm doing now with Stapleverse is very similar. I get to create, sure, I love making clothes. I love making shoes. I love retail, all that stuff. But now I get to create storytelling, lore, characters. I get to take them on different journeys all over the world. I even get to take them outside of planet Earth if I wanted to. Like I could go to another another planet, right? It's literally only limited by my imagination. But with that being said, we are starting chapter one of Stapleverse right here in New York City where I came from. So I'm, I'm sort of mirroring my journey uh, in the physical world through the NFT world so that people get a really good understanding of my roots and my history. So it's interesting, like our, our mascot is a pigeon and everyone really knows our brand because of the pigeon logo. So when there was news that we were coming out with this NFT project, they assumed it was going to be like 10,000 pigeon profile <laughs> pictures, right? Yeah. And I, you know what, I probably would have made decent money if I did that. It probably would have been a fine project, but I, I sort of zigged when everyone thought I was going to zag. And what we did was we released 10,000 feed items. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these feed items are basically, in my mind, foods that you would see a New York City pigeon eating. And they're real like New York City strange things. Like you, we've got like, obviously like pizzas and bagels and coffee beans and tea bags, but we also got weird things like a syringe, a subway token, like a used condom, a cockroach. There's just like real grimy New York City stuff, right? And the idea is that you buy these feed NFTs and then later on, and actually later on, I'm talking about like in about two weeks, you would take that feed and you have to now toss it to try to catch a pigeon. Similar to if you're sitting in Central Park and you're trying to get pigeons, you have to like toss them food, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you toss food and try to get a pigeon, you get shat on by a pigeon also, <laughs> right? So we have this whole gamification where like you buy feed, you now have to throw your feet out, try to catch a pigeon, but you might catch a pigeon shit NFT also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because now we have these three factions, we have the people who will get pigeons, the people who will get poop and the people who will not throw out their feet. They want to keep their feed. There's this like interaction gamification that's happening where like the three crews are sort of like battling with each other. And this goes back to my early days of like DJ battles and B-boy battles. It's just like, I love these crews that organically form uh, and it just friendly competition. It just makes all, you know, everyone like work harder and, and be more um, invested in what they're trying to do. It, you know, it's amazing that these concepts that we do see in the physical world, right? Um, how they translate into these digital spaces and, and what you're talking about is really this cross-section of so many different things, gamification, art, 
right? What's going on, a physical thing that happens um, in, in New York City with, with pigeons, right? Um, it's really, really cool. And I'm curious, when you first heard about this idea of a metaverse and, and these digital universes and digital spaces, um, you know, so to some extent, it probably made sense that this could be interesting, but did it always make sense that you could build a profitable, profitable business on this model in this space? Was that something that was always apparent to you? And, and if, if so, you know, then is, are you just a genius? Or if not, like, what was, what was the point in time when that really did click for you? You know, I like to consider myself like half businessman, half artist. Hmm. I think the, the artist side of me says like, I don't go into a new venture because of the money, hmm. right? Like a businessman or a businesswoman says, I'm going to venture into this new thing and the ROI has to be there. The money I put in, I have to get it back 10x or I'm not even going to do it, right? The artist is different because the artist will be like, I mean, a smart artist will say, listen, I don't want to lose my pants on this deal, right? But I don't mind if I don't make money or don't make a lot of money as long as I don't go bankrupt doing this, but it fulfills me creatively, I'm down to explore it. And so when it comes to this space, I didn't do it for the money. I knew that there was a possibility of making money, but if it, if I didn't have the ability to express my artistic needs through this medium. I wouldn't have touched it. You know, like, I, like, why wouldn't I open? Like, you know what? If you want to make money in New York City, you know what you do? You buy a parking garage. <laughs> parking, parking yeah, is mad expensive in New York City. So if I wanted to make easy money, I would get a parking lot. But that's not creatively fulfilling for me. You know, so I'm not going to go there. Um, this NFT space was very creatively fulfilling for me because as I said, I get to create anything that I want to do. It definitely was helpful that there was this potential of a golden pot at the end of this rainbow, but I would have also been happy if there wasn't. And I just got to create, put stuff out there. Um, the fans that I already have, have a new way of interacting with my brand. Um, and it's really dope. I got to say like the fan base in the NFT space is very different than web to Instagram, Twitter. It's like mm -hmm. they're, they speak a whole different way. They're very, very supportive. You know how on Twitter and Instagram, it's like, there's just, you get into these rabbit holes of like, you know, just oh. hate and criticism and like depression and stuff. But like, it is so positive right now in the NFT space. And I'm sure it'll regulate, you know, in a bit, but right now everyone is really gung ho. You got these sayings that are like, LFG, like let's F and go. And like, wag me is like, we all going to make it, you know, like, all of these things are like really dope. Um, and I, I, I love the positive. I, I was actually really surprised. Two things surprised me about this space. One is how inspired I was by how positive the community was. And number two, frankly, like a year ago, you know, I collect vinyl records, comic books, sneakers, right? Um, I never thought that I would be into collecting, as you said, JPEGs in a folder, right? That didn't seem like something interesting to me, but it happened about a month ago where I looked at my like crypto NFT wallet and I started doing that thing that collectors do. Like I started moving stuff around. I started saying, you know what? I need one more to just fill out that series that I'm trying to fill out. You know, it, wine collectors do it, watch collectors do it, you know, like art collectors do it. And I started doing it with JPEGs on my computer. And I, and I checked myself because I was like, wow, it's happening. This is happening to me. And, and I have a great internal radar temperature check on myself that if I'm feeling something, there's a damn good chance that hundreds of other people are feeling the same thing. So it, it becomes like a real thing for me, you know, and that just happened like a month ago. So, so I'm curious as, as an avid collector of many things, you know, both in the physical world, right? So sneakers, right? I, I'm like a baby sneaker head. I, I like bought, um, I, I went from having, you know, up until last year, like two pairs of shoes ever. to now I have like, you know, maybe like 30 pairs, right? So I'm yeah, I'm yeah. Sneaker, really, really trying to get into it. So, um, you know, I'm, I I'm curious, I'm curious for you in the physical world, like when you're collecting things, what is the thought process? Like what attracts you to something that you say, hey, this is valuable or this is something that I want in my collection? And how is that similar or different uh, than that thought process in the, in the physical, in the digital space? Uh, it's, it's the same, first of all. But I love this question because um, there's, there's a, to me, there's a fine line between a collector and a curator, okay? Mm. A collector is a speculator, they go out and say, what is the inherent upside value of this investment that I'm about to make? It's an asset, right? It's an asset investment, right? A curator says, 
I don't care what the resale value of this is going to be. I like it. It speaks to me. I F with this, right? And even if someone says, yo, that's whack, it's already like below retail or whatever, like, I don't care. I like it. You know, I remember when I was young, there used to be these stores in in, in the Northeast called like VIM and Dr. J's, right? And Models. These are like not cool sneaker stores. They're basically like sporting goods stores. And I remember I would like look in the bargain bins and in the 70% off racks and I would try to find a gem. And my goal would be that like, I found something on the closeout rack. I rock it to school the next day and people like, yo, what are those? I've never seen those. I'm like, that's right. You don't know where I got these. And I ain't telling you <laughs> that to me is the biggest goal, not to go into the hypest sneaker store, wait online five hours, buy something for five X retail rocket and be like, yo, wow. You it's like, yeah, no, no shit, Sherlock. Like everyone knew that these were the hottest things on earth. But if you can unearth like a gem, that to me is like what a curator does. And that's what I've been doing with sneakers and comic books and vinyl all my life. Like I have a very obscure collection of stuff. It's not like the hypest stuff, but I do believe that it's a representation of me. And that's the same thing when it comes to uh, with NFTs. Like the, the, the sort of hallmark names are like crypto punks or like board apes and stuff. I don't have any of those. I have all these things that I just personally really love. Um, and I, I, I wish more people, whether they were creatives or not creatives, instead of looking at your favorite influencer or magazine or blog to tell you what to buy, I wish they would look in the mirror more and be like, what do you want? Like, what do you actually want? Like, forget what the magazine or the blog tells you, like, what do you actually want to wear? You know? Um, and I think people will just get a lot more enjoyment out of it and they won't get so stressed out about like fluctuations and trends coming and going and stuff like, cause you're just being real with yourself, you know? Yeah. That's, that's profound advice. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, earlier you said, uh, you're, you're the king of collaboration or you're, you're, you're known by some other people say, yeah, I don't yeah, say right, it. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Not self-acclaimed. Right. But, but some <laughs> no. people we'll call you the king of collaboration. And I think you have a great example about, you know, not creating, you know, not trying to compete with Timberland because it will take you 20 years to do what they do. Right. And, and to some extent, um, in the physical world, collaboration is necessitated because expertise is decentralized, right? Uh, there are barriers to entry to be good or great at something. And so it makes sense to go to someone who is great at something else and you're great at something else and you can come together and build something that's you know better than, than the two of you as individuals, right? I'm curious in, in the digital space, what would your advice be to businesses and creators and anyone who wants to collaborate in the digital space, in the metaverse, because seemingly the barriers are minimized, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said earlier, if you can think it and you can code it, it can be done, right? So if, if those barriers are minimized, how should people think about collaboration instead of everyone just sort of going yeah. and doing their own things and you've got a, this proliferation of, of everything that is sort of kind of the same? What, what are your thoughts on that? Dude, that's a that's a great question. I mean, like you're right, but in the web two, web one world, it was about different types of expertises coming together, right? Mm -hmm. I think like so, as I mentioned, I've only been in the space for nine months, but in this nine months, I have collaborated with like three to five different groups. I'm working on other collaborations as well. So I'm still collaborating with people in the space, but what I've noticed that's different is that when we collaborate in the NFT space, it's more like we're both finding out stuff together. We're both discovering at the same time. And I almost sort of like want to give an analogy. If you can imagine the picture of like, imagine you and a buddy are walking into a, like a dense forest together and you've got like a weed whacker, right? And you're just like hacking away at the weeds and you're just trying to find the path, right? Everyone in the NFT space right now, literally, I want to say everyone, even people who you think are like experts and veterans in the NFT space, they are hacking away. We are all trailblazing right now. There is no predisposed path for us to follow in this because the entire universe was only created just a few years ago. You know, So everything that everyone is doing is brand spanking new. And so when I collaborate with people, it's almost like, hey, let's take what you've learned, your, your, your very small learnings and my very small learnings. If we add them together, we've got a little bit better learning and now we can navigate this a little bit better and, and get maybe a little bit ahead. That's why I, I found the reason why I've been collaborating with people so far. It's more like 
knowledge information sharing. It's like a, it's like if you're on a treasure hunt or like a, you know, a wild goose chase or like an Easter egg hunt, you know, you like share clues with each other to figure out how to get to the solution. That's kind of what web three NFT collaboration is like. Whereas web two, web one collaboration is more about one plus one equals 10. It's like, yo, you do this great. I do this great. If we come together, we gonna make it rain. <laughs> you know, like, if that's what it's more about, but it's like, no, nah, it, no one thinks like that in, in web three. Web three is like, let's do this right for the culture because it's almost like we have a subculture that we feel responsible for the future of, you know, it's like, I would maybe equate it to like early, early skateboarders or early, early graffiti artists. Like we have to take care of this culture so it doesn't like go to shit basically, you know? Yeah. That's a that's great the, question. I never thought of that until now. That's no, I mean, you're dropping gems and I love how you simplify everything with these analogies because it just makes it so understandable. And that's really what we're trying to do uh, here at Afrotech with these conversations with people like you and, and other uh, great people in the space that we've had the pleasure of speaking with. Appreciate just, it to help to demystify it for the audience. So, so I appreciate that. Uh, the last question I've got for you is, um, it, it's something that I'm personally really, really curious about. Uh, as a, you know, as a, as a creator and someone who's been doing this, you know, like we, as we said for decades, right? When you're in a creative wreck, right? When you hit that block, what are some things you do? What are some ways that you find inspiration to get yourself going again? I'm, I'm really curious, like what your techniques and tips there are. I mean this is going to be different for everyone, right? So it's to each his own. But as you know, I exist in this space and in this in this community called street culture, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why they call it street culture is because people, like real people, walk and operate in these streets, right? So street culture to me is like taking the subway or taking the bus or just walking five miles in your hometown, right? That to me is the essence of street culture. And that's what makes it different than like, high fashion or couture fashion, right? Because, hey, that outfit that you wore walking down the catwalk or, or runway looks really beautiful, but ain't gonna work on Fulton Ave or like, you know, like right. Nordstrom, you know what I mean? Like, so like real people in these real streets is what streetwear is all about. And so when I get in a rut, what I like to do is I like to travel. And I wanna, I wanna put an asterisk on that word travel because I realize that travel is a privilege, right? Not everyone in this world can be like, I'm gonna to go to JFK and travel now, right? But I wanna put an asterisk on that word travel because sometimes when I don't have the ability to actually go out and travel, travel could actually just mean taking a different path to work. Like take a different train. It, when you walk your dog, don't go right, go left, like go the other route, you know, and just see a different block, see a different neighborhood. You know how many people that, live in New York City that have like never been to Queens or the Bronx, you know, like just go there for dinner one night, right? That is traveling. And I think when I do that, um, I just love seeing how different people in different communities operate, live and breathe. Listen, I've got a, I've got a globally known clothing brand that this year is the 25th anniversary of. It wouldn't be successful if I only made stuff for people who lived only in downtown New York City. I had to go out there and see LA, Miami, Houston, Atlanta, Berlin, Tokyo, London, and be like, oh, this is how street culture and, you know, street culture. I mean, real, when I say street culture, I mean, real people in real streets, right? This is how real people in real streets just live, breathe and operate. Now me as a creator, I want to make stuff for them. And I think that is one of the secret sauces for why staple has continued to spread because it wasn't too niche it wasn't too insulated it was sort of democratic for everyone and everyone who sort of just like is not fancy runway model kind of looking you know shopping at the most highest end department stores um but i deliberately did that all throughout and so when i need inspiration i just turn to my my customer really i just go to the street i'll sit at a cafe on a corner and i'll just people watch um and i try to do it as much as i can outside of my comfort zone of my hometown of my home neighborhood uh, and just just get out there and see the world, get, you know, take a bus, take a walk, whatever. But if you get stuck in a rut, I find just seeing something outside of your normal perspective, perspective helps tremendously. And that's sage advice. And really the way you, you framed it is like turn to your customer. Right. And if you mm -hmm. want to uh, and that's true for any entrepreneur. Right. You turn to your customer. And if you want to grow the business. Right turn to different customers, right? Get out of your comfort zone and, and yeah. experience, you know, different energies. Um, yep. so, so that's dope. Uh, Jeff, I, I appreciate you stopping by and, and having this, this talk, man, you this dropped so many gems. 
Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm excited about the conversation. I know everyone in attendance is as well. Uh, so real quick, yeah, just where can people find you on social? Any things you want to highlight before we sign off? Yeah, I mean, I'm on the socials at Jeff Staple, all one word. Um, follow me on, you know, the, the latest in fashion, streetwear, sneakers, retail, design. It's a lot. Uh, NFTs, metaverse. But uh, if, if you go down um, and hang with us, you can learn a lot, I think. So hope to see you on the other side.